Well, good evening to all of you. Good to see all of your bright, shining faces. You're spread all around the room. One of the things you'll discover about me is I have spent most of my career engaged in leadership development and training, which means I tend to roam a bit. So no matter where you sit, I will find you. Uh, this is a workshop. Uh, we're in just a few moments. I know many of you have commented on the fact that you don't have a workbook in front of you. In just a few moments, they will be distributed to you. I always begin by wanting to make a couple of comments before you get the workbook. And that's primarily what I want you to do is not look ahead. All right, there's a natural temptation to see where I'm going and to want to jump ahead and I'm asking you not to do that. And I'm asking you to look at the people that are sitting on either side of you. They're gonna be watching you carefully to make sure that you don't violate this rule or instruction. Uh, I like to have the content of these sessions kind of develop as we go forward. This is a series of sessions, four sessions that kind of build on one another. We're going to be spending our time in two sessions this evening, two sessions tomorrow morning. So in case you're perhaps thinking I'll go to one and maybe two and I won't go to the others, you really, to get the full gist of leaders and followers in the home, the church, and in business indeed, you have to kind of be with me through the whole four sessions. And so I hope you'll, you'll make plans to be here tomorrow morning as well. I know in some cases you simply can't help it, but I think it'll be more profitable to you if indeed you are here for all four sessions. I promise you that this will be unlike sermons. Uh, I am a facilitator. I am a, an instructor. There are going to be exercises. Pens should be nearby. In just a moment, we're going to hand out the workbooks. And if you don't have a pen, you want to raise your hand so you can get one, because I'm going to have you do some things for me as together we try to work through an understanding of what makes for effective leaders and followers in both the home, the church, and for many of you, I am sure you work in business. And I suspect for some of you, you have, if you've been working in business, there have been times when you have had leaders that you deemed not to be very good, and maybe on occasion you have had a leader that you thought this is the best leader I've ever had. Yeah, that is the fairly common experience. Most people, and I've, I've done a lot of leadership workshops in business for the last four decades, most of the participants who come to training that I conduct, most of them will attest to the fact that they have had far greater number of poor leaders than good leaders. And so we're going to try to understand the why behind that. And so uh, just a little bit of background about who I am. For some of you, it's who is this guy. Perhaps you've seen my, the video that the, the elders had me prepare. So you know me a little better than perhaps I know you. Uh, I spent, as I mentioned, probably four decades doing leadership development for a host of organizations. I, I began corporately with the Walgreens company. Their headquarters is in Deerfield, Illinois, and I would lead managers to better understanding of what leadership is. I then went up to central Wisconsin, a company up there called Century Insurance, a $2 billion a year insurance company. I did leadership and management development up there, succession planning. That is, how do we make sure that we have leaders in the wings that we're grooming to take over the reins of leadership as leaders tend to, to retire or leave? And that, that's a very, very crucial uh, discussion when we're talking about the Lord's Church. We can have elders in the Lord's Church, but the question is, are we grooming future leaders to lead a local congregation? I then left Century Insurance and went to Arthur Anderson and Company. Some of you may know what that company is and no longer exists. I had nothing to do with that. Uh, you may have heard about the Enron debacle where Arthur Anderson, one of the largest public accounting firms in the world, came to an inglorious end. And I will tell you why. Because of bad leadership. I then left Arthur Anderson before they ceased to exist, went to a, a company in downtown Chicago called Helene Curtis, small company going up against the likes of Procter and Gamble, and they wanted me to develop leaders as they grew from a small kind of 
family-owned operation to a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, and it was then that I departed and went out and started my own company. And so I have been doing management consulting leadership work for a host of organizations for the last 30 years. Some of the companies that I've done work for you know of, Motorola, McDonald's, headquarters is up in, in Northern Illinois, T. Rowe Price, a financial services company, uh, AT&T, UPS, GM, those are just the, the well-known companies that I've attempted to help them groom and develop leaders. Let me share with you what happened early in my career. And, and beside all of that corporate experience and work trying to develop leaders, I'm a Christian and have been since I was age 13. And I have a great love for the Word of God. And an early aha moment that occurred to me early in my time and career, in my career developing leaders, was the best management leadership principles, techniques, and tools come straight from the Word of God. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised by that. Because it's inspired. And the greatest leader to have ever walked on the face of the earth, Jesus Christ, stands, I believe, as one of the greatest examples that we could emulate in our efforts to lead more effectively. And there are others within the pages of the Bible that I think probably qualify as being excellent, excellent leaders. Does that mean they were perfect? By no means. But they demonstrated certain skills, certain abilities that I think anybody who wants to be a leader needs to aspire to. And so what we're going through with this workshop is kind of a marriage of all of what I learned corporately about managers and leaders and the Word of God. And very early on, I began to teach principles, techniques to managers and leaders, the principles of which are found in the Bible. You, some of you may have heard of a thing called Servant leadership. If you haven't, we're going to be talking about that during this, this four-hour session time that we're spending together. Come on in, folks. There's all kinds of seats anywhere. Uh, servant leadership is a, is a great concept, but you know who best exemplifies servant leadership? Christ. Jesus Christ. He was a servant leader. And that seems somewhat alien to people in corporate America. Uh, there, is a dis there is a disposition that exists amongst a lot of leaders in corporate America that my followers serve me rather than I serve my followers. And yet Jesus turns that on its ear. He came as a servant. He humbled himself. And there's a lot of insight to be gained about how to be a more effective leader uh, by looking at Jesus Christ. All right, that's kind of an introduction. In just a moment, we're going to hand out the workbooks. Please don't look ahead. Uh, natural temptation to do so, but please, I beg you not to do that. So whomever is going to help hand out the books, just a group of guys, if you go ahead and get those distributed. If you need a pen, also raise your hand because there are going to be opportunities for you to write some things down. All right? put pens and all the things behind the, where the business cards are, so you can grab a pen out of there. But if you need one, raise your hand. Yeah, so we'll take a moment here to get the, the books handed out to you. These should be of sufficient substance that you can use them as a writing surface uh, as we begin our journey uh, in getting a better handle on what makes for effective leaders and followers in the home, the church, and I would argue even in business. All right, so as they're getting those handed out, what we're going to do in session one, kind of give you an idea of where we're going, we're going to define some terms. Um, that's, I think, important for us to understand. I, I keep using the term leadership and management. Are they different? How are they different? Are they similar? How are they similar? And that is actually one of the very first things that we're going to be turning our attention to in just a few moments. The other primary intention of session one is to understand what I believe to be the crucial factor of leadership. If you want to be a leader, there is one particular attribute, characteristic, above all others that I think is especially important. 
And you might not yet know what that is. By the way, there's a couple of you in here. I think the elders have read or have gotten a copy of the book that I wrote. Um, a little aside, uh, I've done about eight of these workshops for various churches across the country. And I quickly realized that there's only one of me and there's so many churches. And so over the last year, I spent time writing a book, much of the content of which we're going to be talking about this evening and tomorrow morning, with the intent that I can't be everywhere. Maybe the book will be of some assistance. Matt, could you ask if anybody needs a book or a pen? Yeah, does anybody need a pen or a book, workbook? Everybody got one? Uh, let me say this to those of you who have gotten the book and read it. Uh, don't dominate the conversation. You have, you have information that the rest of the people in the room do not yet have. So I'm going to ask you to be a little guarded in responding because if you respond uh, with what you've read from the book, then you're kind of giving a, a how moment prematurely to the rest of the folks here. All right. Let me begin by asking this. How many of you are followers? This, this is a, an engagement kind of opportunity here. So how many of you are followers? And I would expect to see every hand raised. All right? Now, that's kind of interesting. Let me kind of follow that up with another question. How many of you are leaders? Raise your hands if you're a leader. Uh, I see fewer hands. I guess I would expect to. Uh, some of you are looking at the person next to you and wondering, wait a minute, why did you raise your hand? How are you a leader? Um, now, and maybe I could amend that. Not only how many of you are leaders, how many of you aspire to lead? So you may currently be a leader, but you still have aspirations to lead. All right? Now, that kind of leads to a very, very interesting point that I would like to make. Somebody once said that followers are leaders in training. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. In fact, let me plant the seed in your mind. What real distinction exists between a good follower and a good leader? And I'm going to tell you, there isn't much. There is some, but not a great amount. And so the idea is that if you aspire to being a good leader, you have to first be a good follower. That the attributes of both are very, very similar. And to kind of put that in another way, first of all, let me share with you, just go to a Barnes & Noble and go into the business section, and you're going to see so many books on the subject of leadership. Uh, this, this goes back a while. I, I was trying to figure out how many books have been written to date about leadership. I found an article that talked, it was, it was like 13 years ago, that said 50, there was 15,000 books about leadership in print. I would argue the number is much higher now. Now, what does that tell you? That there are so many books about leadership. What it begins to tell me is that because so much has been written, it tells us how elusive it is both to define and to develop leadership. Seems like everybody's taking a crack at it because there's a certain mysticism surrounding leadership. We don't, we don't feel that mysticism about being a good manager, if we're a manager. We recognize that people who are good managers became good managers because of education and experience. But when we talk about what makes a good leadership, things get a little bit more nebulous. There is a certain aura or mysticism about what makes a great leader. I have an assertion to make. What makes a good leader and a good follower in the home, the church, or the business is the same, and the Word of God is a great source for understanding and developing both. And with that in mind, let me suggest to you, all of us follow more than we lead. We have leaders in this room. We have elders. We may have some business leaders in this room. Doesn't matter you still engage in more following than you do leading. In fact, Christians follow Christ. I, I, by the way, let me just pause here and say, this evening is already to be celebrated, not because of the training that I'm doing, but because of a new sister in Christ. Amen. Uh, for many of you who hadn't gotten here a bit earlier, about 6.30 this evening, uh, a young woman was baptized into Christ. This is already a day for celebration. 
Christians follow Christ. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So that's why I would assert it doesn't matter what position you hold in an organization, the role that you might play in a family, or the role that you might play in a local congregation, you are first and foremost, or should be, a follower. And it is with that in mind that I would argue that we follow governing officials, we follow elders, wives follow husbands, children follow parents. So while following dominates our lives, it doesn't tend to dominate our thinking. And you know how I can prove that? How many books have you ever seen on the subject of being a good follower? I've never seen one. 15,000 plus books, probably 18 or 20,000 now, all of them talking about followers, but I see virtually nothing about, I mean, following leaders, I see virtually nothing about followers. The thing is this, you can't really effectively talk about leadership without also talking about followers. They go hand in hand. And that's what we're going to be doing on our journey as we begin this evening. And so I've got six workshop objectives. These are the things you will be able to do as a result of the time that we spend together. So after this workshop, you'll be able to explain the difference between leading and managing. You might not have ever really thought much about that. But there's a difference. And actually, you'll discover the Bible speaks about both. So we're going to understand the difference between leading and managing. We're going to explain that crucial factor I alluded to earlier that I think is probably most germane, most important to making one an effective leader. We're going to define leadership in a practical, usable way. Um, it has been suggested that there are as many definitions of leadership as there are people who have attempted to define it. Uh, and I, I can attest to that. Well, I'm going to give you a definition of leadership that is simple to remember, you will never forget, but is also very practical and usable. A lot of leadership gets into very, very theoretical concepts. I'm going to give you one that actually is practical and usable. That will be coming up later. We're going to identify five different types of followers. If you find yourself in a leadership role, guess what? You need to lead different followers differently. It's a thing in the business world that we call situational leadership. That I determine how best to lead by the circumstance, the situation. In other words, the person I'm attempting to lead rather than using the default style of leadership with everybody. So we're going to talk about five different types of followers and five different leadership styles. And then we're going to talk about how leaders can positively or negatively impact followers. I mean, I've got stories to tell from my own career in corporate America. Leaders that actually demotivated me, made it hard for me to do the job I was given to do because they were so poor as leaders. And I can count on one hand, probably on three fingers, those that, in my career, I would deem to have been excellent leaders. So we're going to talk about why that happens and how, if we aspire to being a leader or we are currently a leader, how we can be a positive one, impacting our followers positively as opposed to negatively. And improve skills in leading and following in the home and church. This is not just for leaders, by the way. We're going to be talking about followers, too, and how we can all play the role of follower better than perhaps we have. All right. This is where we're going to get into our book books. I want you to notice on the screen, up in the upper left-hand corner, it says page 5. And there will always be a number up there to show you where we are in your workbooks. So go ahead and turn to page 5 in your workbooks. We're going to jump right in here to begin looking at how the Word of God actually makes mention of both leaders and followers. And I'm going to put you to the task of helping to determine what is the difference between them. So you should be on page five in your materials, and you'll note then that I've got some passages of scripture. One passage in particular, Hebrews 13, 17, we read, Obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over your souls, 
And then we have one passage. There are other places where both terms are used, but in Luke 12, 42, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household? So the Bible uses both terms. My question to you, and this is where I want you to start thinking through this, I'd like you to begin to define management and leadership in the spaces provided on you, in your materials. So how is a leader and a manager different? Go ahead and write it down. Write it down. Go ahead and begin to capture your own thoughts about the difference between a manager and a leader. And I'll give you a few minutes to, to capture some thoughts. I want to engage you on this. Come on in, folks. Um, are there workbooks? I see a workbook over here. Where are some of the workbooks? Okay. All right. Hi. Hi. There you go. Hey, John. Good to see you. We're on page five of the workbook. Uh, here's a pen. And we're trying to distinguish between managers and leaders. Page five in your workbook. How is a leader or a manager different? So you're defining leadership, you're defining management. All right, uh, we won't give you much more time than that. We have miles to go before we sleep to borrow a poem from, from a poem by Robert Frost. Uh, before I get a couple of responses from some of the more intrepid in here who are willing to share their, their understanding of the difference between leadership and management, let me, let me follow up with that question at the bottom of your page. How many of you would rather be led than managed? How many of you would rather be led than managed? Okay, and I'm seeing pretty much the entirety of the group. The fact that you respond that way tells me that you think there's a difference. I've asked that question in corporate America with different organizations for decades. Every single time I ask that question, every participant in the room says, I'd rather be led than managed. That means in their mind there's a difference. So now let's get on the table some of the differences. Who wants to offer up a definition of what was the first one on there is leadership. So do you have an answer? Uh, yes. I put down providing example, leading by example. It's quality. It motivates. It's the spiritual aspect of, of management. Okay. So I hear the word example, leading by example. It's quality. What were some of the other words? Um, motivational. Motivational. Meaning, obviously, to the followers, right? Right, and it's, it seems more spiritual than manual. Spiritual, more spiritual, okay. And let me, right now, just make a point. Managers are needed. I do not mean to denigrate the importance of management. Management is crucially important. It isn't a good one and a bad one. But there are differences. Okay, I saw a couple of the hands over here. Yes. Leader delegates? Does a manager not delegate? I think a leader is the broader form that oversees everything, whereas a manager oversees a more specific. More, more narrow, management, leader, more broad. Okay, all right. Sir, you had one? Yes. I have leadership is showing people the way to get to some goal and helping them understand how to get there. Okay, all right. He's getting dangerously close to the textbook definition here. 
Yes. Okay. And uh, you work in business, I, I presume? <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's, he's given me a lot of what you would find if you were to open one of those 15,000 books. And that's what we want to try to get at. Yes, sir. Higher in rank? Not just that difference, but also one tends to one tends to be more open hearted with the person they're dealing with. Okay. The leader and the manager. Um, they're left they're more limited um, in being able to do that because it's because for the manager they're trying to make sure things run smoothly. Okay, and there's a couple of interesting words. The idea of a manager things a leader, more engagement with followers. And I, and I think there's, there's a lot to be said about that. All right, we'll take a couple more and then we're going to move on here. Simply, um, a leader is someone that points us, or is pointing us to a greater reward. Okay. Leading the way. Correct. And a manager may be then the person who's figuring out best to get there. Here's where we're going how do we accomplish that in the most efficient way? All right, and this is getting very close to some of the distinctions you begin to read about in textbooks. Yes, one more. I think a manager is one that handles problems before it goes to the leader. Okay, a manager may be the stopgap, handling problems before they escalate and create bigger issues. All right, now, and, and, and I hope this is very similar to what some of you had. Okay, I see a hand that has dying for attention over here. All right. Uh, I'm hoping you can improve on what I learned in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned that everybody's a leader, whether you're a sergeant or a general, mm -hmm. but uh, because of the ranks below you. But they divided, in a sense, the commission officers were considered leaders because they strategized and planned and the enlisted, the sergeants executed that plan. Right. Or the manager, so to speak. Okay. You know, the military model is an interesting one, and he just made a statement, which I find kind of interesting. We'll talk about this. Could it be that all of us are leaders? Now, I'm just going to plant that seed. We'll get back to that a little bit later, okay? But that, that's kind of what you began with. And even somebody lower in rank may have the need to be a leader for the work they do, even though it may not be at the higher levels of the strategy that the higher level military leaders are conducting, right? Okay, keep that, keep that thought in mind. Now, let me suggest to you, and I'm going to share with you, and see if this resonates with what you've written as well, and it does resonate with what many of you have put on your page and we've heard. Leaders, if you really want to begin to understand the distinction, leaders communicate vision, mission, inspire and motivate people, provide an example to follow. We heard that. Leadership is more long-term, broad, and focus. All right? Now, I'm, I'm, what I'm doing for you is I'm distilling a lot of those texts, those books that have been written. I've read many of them. So there is where we begin to understand a little bit better about leaders and how they differentiate. A guy by the name of Warren Bennis, he wrote a number of books on leadership. He makes the statement, good leaders do the right things. And now look at what we read or understand about managers. They administer things and tasks, direct and organize people, coordinate efforts, management is more short-term implementation focus, and Bennis now says good managers do things right. Interesting distinction. And I would submit to you that another way of looking at this is that leaders are purpose and people directed. Purpose and people directed. They are more concerned with where we are going and Managers are more process and project directed how best to get there. Okay? So, so think of a leader in an organization charting a long term future goal and then turning it over to managers to figure out how best to accomplish that, how to organize people, what is needed in terms of resources. All right? My point is this. 
And I, there's the question. But my point is this. The crucial factor is purpose. The one thing that clearly delineates a leader from a manager is purpose. And I can prove it to you. We can look at, and by the way, when we look at this, this is kind of interesting. You, you look on page five, these two passages. This statement, leaders, in the context of the home and church, leaders are keeping watch over souls, managers over a household. And there's a difference. You Notice know, somebody said it's spiritual. And in the context of the church, there's no doubt about that. All right? I, I think the Hebrew writer here is talking about elders, though he doesn't say elders. But I, elders are certainly included here. Elders, as leaders, have the responsibility of keeping watch over souls. A manager has responsibility over a household. And this is where it gets pretty interesting, because you look at the word household. Uh, this is from Holman Bible Dictionary. Household in the New Testament often means family, servants, vineyards, facilities. Managing is more about overseeing household affairs, whereas leading is more narrowly focused on watching over souls. Let's relate this to a local church. Who should be watching over souls? Who should be engaged in managing things. Deacons. Deacons, all right? Now, I don't know anything about this church. I mean, Herb and I went to school together, but he hasn't divulged much about this congregation. But let me, let me just share with you my perspective from living many, many years on the face of the earth and worshiping with a number of congregations over those years. Here's sometimes what frightens me. I see evangelists often doing the work of elders taking care of the spiritually broken. I see elders spending too much time engaged in things like the facility, the parking lot, the air conditioning, business meetings, and deacons are not doing much more than active members. And I think that's a problem. I think when we look at this understanding, elders should be primarily engaged in the spiritual welfare, the souls that they're shepherding. And that deacons should be given the responsibility to deal with the household things. And I'm afraid sometimes that doesn't happen. I, I don't know about the inner workings here. You will all have to be the judge of that. But I will tell you in many congregations, I think elders are spending too much time doing the work of deacons. Now, that's just my assessment, okay? And that's one of the reasons that I put this material together. Purpose is at the heart of effective leadership. That's why you have a compass on the cover of your booklet. I wanted to convey the idea of a compass conveys the idea of going someplace. The proverb writer says in Proverbs 11:14, where there is no guidance, a people falls. And with that in mind, let me just share with you, and I'm, I'm making the point now, that purpose is at the heart of leadership. And here's my proof. Jesus, the Son of Man, came to seek and save the lost. That was his purpose in coming to this earth. And I would submit to you, there was never a day that he woke up in the morning and thought, I wonder what I will do today. He unerringly knew why he had come to this earth and nothing was going to deviate or direct him away from his intent and his purpose. Everything he did was with the intent of seeking and saving the lost. That's what makes him the best leader to have ever walked on the face of the earth. Not only because his mission is to save souls, but because he was purpose-focused. He never lost sight of his purpose. But he's not the only one. In Philippians 3.14, Paul, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's purpose-driven. What, what, what do we call the trips that Paul went on? Missionary journeys. Mission. Purpose. Uh, 
1 Timothy 3.15, it looks to me like Paul is giving us some insight about the mission, the purpose of a local congregation. The church of the living God, the pillar and the support of the truth. That's who we are. That's the charge that we have been given. And then we can go back into the Old Testament, Joshua 24.15, that most of us are very familiar with. We're there. Joshua says, choose today whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And knowing the character of Joshua, when he made that statement, I doubt there was any family members who hadn't already heard that. I think the life that Joshua led was one that was clear to his household. We will serve the Lord. And so fathers, dads, and families... Mission and purpose for the family is as important as church mission and purpose. The question is, do we know what our purpose or mission is? Being clear about purpose is crucial to effective leadership for this reason. Leadership, the word leadership conveys the idea of movement from a to be. Leadership conveys the importance of where we are to where we want to be or where we are going. Leaders are clear about where they are leading. I would argue that's probably the most important thing if you aspire to being a good leader. No questions about here's what we're doing if you're the leader of the family. Here's what we're doing if you're the leaders of a congregation. Here's what we're doing if you're a leader in business. Purpose, direction, clarity, that is crucial. But here's what happens. By the way, uh, there's a guy by the name of Robert K. Greenleaf. I found this quote, and I find it very interesting. Leaders are better than most at pointing the direction. As long as one is leading, one always has a goal. It may be a goal arrived at by group consensus, or the leader acting on inspiration may simply have said, let's go this way. But the leader always knows what it is and can articulate it for any who are unsure. By clearly stating and restating the goal, the leader gives certainty to those who may have difficulty in achieving it for themselves. Goal, he writes, is used here in the special sense of the overarching purpose, the big dream, the visionary concept, the ultimate consummation that one approaches but never really achieves. It is something presently out of reach it excites the imagination and challenges people to work for something they do not yet know how to do. And all I can say is amen. amen. That perfectly communicates Jesus Christ on this earth. But there's a problem. The problem is this. Sometimes we fall victim to a thing called the activity trap. And uh, there's a, there was an etymologist by the name of Jean-Henri Fabre who did some research many, many years ago about processionary caterpillars. Let me just read, and by the way, this is funny because it was way back when I took zoology back at Florida College that I came across this story, and I've carried it with me ever since. Processionary caterpillars feed upon pine needles. They move through the trees in a long procession, one leading and the other following, each with his eyes half closed and his head snugly fitted against the rear extremity of his predecessor. Jean-Henri Fabre, the great French naturalist, after patiently experimenting with a group of caterpillars, finally enticed them to the rim of a large flower pot, which started moving around procession with neither beginning or end. The naturalist expected that after a while they would catch on to the joke, get tired of their useless march, and start off in some new direction, but not so. Through sheer force of habit, the leading creeping circle kept moving around the rim of the pot. They went around and around, keeping the same relentless pace for seven days and seven nights, and would doubtless have continued longer had it not been for sheer exhaustion and ultimate starvation. Incidentally, an ample supply of food was close at hand and plainly visible, but it was outside the range of the circle, so they continued along the well-worn path. They were following instinct, habit, 
custom, past experience, standard practice, whatever you may call it, choose to call it, but they were following blindly. They mistook activity for accomplishment. They meant well, but they got no place. And I would submit to you that that story about processionary caterpillars is frighteningly like what happens to a lot of organizations. And that includes families. Many engage in lots of activity but have lost sight of the primary purpose. Government, businesses, schools, churches, families. What do you think should be the outcome the overarching purpose of a public school? Education, literate, capable, children graduated who can contribute to positively to society. Now my question is this, is that what we're getting? Are there activities going on in our public schools? <laughs> Any of you who have kids in the public schools, it's like you become a shuttle driver. You're driving to and from, and then there's all kinds of activities that are going on. But the question is, are we getting what should be the primary outcome of the public school system, which is educated, functional children? And I would submit to you that many of us are aware that that isn't sometimes what we're getting. Despite all the activity and all the expenditure that goes on, we're not getting that as an outcome. I would argue that's an activity trap. We get caught up in thinking activity is accomplishment because we've lost sight of our reason for existing. Can that happen to churches? I, I submit to you, and I don't know what it's like in Orlando, but I'd be willing to guess that if you drive around here and you look at the certain marquees, you're going to find all kinds of activities that are going on. You look at their websites, you're going to see all kinds of activities. My question is, are they the activities that lead to the mission to be the pillar in support of the truth? Or are they more designed to entertain and to draw numbers? And I would submit to you there is an example of an activity trap. In the Old Testament, God wanted his people to make sacrifices, but eventually what they did is they simply went through the motions. They were bringing their lame and their blind animals to God. So they're going through the motion, they're engaged in the activity, but they lost sight of the reason for the sacrifice, to atone for their sins and to ask God for forgiveness. Now, that leads me to suggest, and by the way, in Isaiah 29, 13, an example, the people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. God wants your heart. Sometimes we give them activities. And, and, you know, I, I don't mean to be harsh about this. I fall victim to it, too. But how many times do we find ourselves engaged in worship on a Sunday, and we're going through the motions, but our hearts are far away? That's an activity trap. Engaging in the activity, but having lost sight of the reason we're engaging in the activity. Now, one of the things that I taught for many years in corporate America was a thing called the planning hierarchy. And I'm going to recommend this to both families and to churches. I'm going to share this with you. But the planning, hi the planning hierarchy begins with mission. Any organization be it a home, be it a church, be it a business, should have a compelling mission. All right, and this is where I pause and say, what's the mission of the church here? So you can save the lost? Anybody else? Huh? Okay, well, you're, you're, you're looking around as you're asking. Well, because, yeah, we say it. Do you? Yes. Good. Good. That's rare. More often than not, when I ask, by the way, this isn't unusual, but I ask churches where I do this, I say, what's your mission? And there's blank stares. They don't know. Do you think it makes a difference? Does it make a difference? Yes. It absolutely makes a difference. Uh, and I will tell you, and you can look at your mission. I mean, this is what I share with, with congregations it all comes down to this. Good missions are meaningful, memorable, and motivating. 
Okay? That really kind of encapsulates what makes a good mission. And in just a few moments, I'm going to suggest as fathers, parents, and halls, maybe there should be a mission for your family. And in local congregations, we need to be clear. There, there should be unanimity of agreement when I ask, what's the mission? It just falls off the lips. We know what it is because we talk about it. All right? And it sounds like that may be going on. From mission, once a mission is articulated, that's not enough. From mission, then, come goals. These are general intents that support the mission. Okay? So a church mission might be to be the pillar in support of the truth. A goal might be let's study to show ourselves approved in order to do that, which is the mission. From goals, then, come these things called objectives. Notice the difference between a goal and an objective. A goal is a general intent, what I might call a wish, but an objective is a measurable intent. And good objectives, some of you may have seen this in business, good objectives satisfy what is referred to as the SMART criteria. Specific, measurable, attainable or achievable, relevant, and time frame. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. And then from objectives come activities. Now we turn people loose because we've articulated our mission, our goals, and our objectives, and now people begin to engage in activity to meet those objectives, to satisfy those goals, to accomplish our mission. You see the, the flow now, a problem occurs. Oftentimes, mission is obscured. We don't all know what it is. And you know, you'd be the, you'd be the judge when I ask, what's the mission of the church here? If you didn't know, then for you, it was obscured. Okay? Some of you tried to articulate what it was, and that's good. But until and unless every member of a congregation, when asked, what's our mission, can tell us you don't have one. At least they don't have one. Uh, this, is a, this was hanging in a lobby of a church where I did this workshop once. Hanging right there actually was on the wall. It said, our church's mission, we exist to teach the lost, to develop obedient and devoted followers who strengthen one another while glorifying God. When I conducted the workshop... I asked, what's your mission? Nobody knew. Why? Because it's hanging in the foyer, they say. It's hanging in the foyer. It's, and, you know, it's interesting you say that. What hangs on the wall it doesn't support what exists in the heart. I would argue it's too long. It is simply too long to be memorable. All right? And what happens is when we don't know our mission and we have not clarified goals and objectives and we're engaged in a lot of activity, but it's activity for activity's sake. We don't know how those activities accomplish our objectives, meet our goals, and satisfy our mission. And when that happens, we are in an activity trap. Uh, how many of you ever heard of a woman by the name of Florence Chadwick? Okay, good. We see, we see one hand back here. Uh, Florence Chadwick was well known as a, a swimmer. She had already, by the time of the event that I'm going to share with you took place, this, this particular event took place on July 4th, 1952. Prior to that date, Florence Chadwick had already successfully swum the English Channel in both directions. All right? The English Channel is 21 miles across. She set the record for women for making that swim. On July 4th, 1952, Florence Chadwick decided that she was going to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast, a distance of 26 miles. Uh, to put it in some perspective, that's about the length of a marathon. And now think of a marathon and you're swimming it instead of running it. So Florence Chadwick, well renowned as a swimmer, got in the water and began her historic swim. She began to swim. Stationed on either side of her was a flotilla of small boats, 
inside of which were men with rifles whose job it was to drive off the sharks that might get too near her. Her trainer was in one of the boats. Even her mom was in one of the boats. Florence Chadwick is swimming. She's swimming. She's swimming. About halfway through her swim, an unfortunate, an unfortunate but not atypical event occurred. A fog bank rolled in on the California coast. Florence is swimming. She's swimming. After 15 hours of swimming, she tells her trainer in the boat beside her, I can't make it. He encourages her to press on. Her mom chimes in and says, you can do it, Florence. And so she continues to swim. But after 15 hours and 30 minutes of swimming, she was taken out of the water, defeated in her effort. She was a half mile from the California coast. And when the press got to her and were asking questions about why she had failed, she said, I'm I'm not making excuses. It wasn't the bone chilling cold. It wasn't even fatigue. It wasn't the sharks that got too near. She said, I couldn't see my goal. Half mile out, if it had been a clear day, she would have seen the California coast. And she is convinced if she had seen it, Nothing would have stopped her from getting to it. But she was defeated by the fog. And that has led me to the conclusion that good leaders continually engage in fog abatement. They not only articulate a compelling mission that stirs the hearts and the souls of everybody, be it in a home, be it in a church, be it in business, but they are continually engaged in fog abatement to make sure that it's clear and before everybody. And so that's why I argue that this is probably the single most crucial thing about being a truly effective leader. And so you could almost look at then this mission, goal, objective, activity, the hierarchy of planning, and you could look at a church from this perspective. What if a church says we will be the pillar and support of the truth? It's biblical. Paul's telling Timothy, here's what local churches do. That might be a good mission for a congregation. And then flowing out of it, study to show ourselves approved, edify and support one another, worship God in spirit and truth, go and proclaim the word, all great general intentions, but the, at the end of the day, there could be debate about whether or not these had been accomplished. That's why you need to get to the next level. Notice what happens when you look at things like objectives. Complete an evangelistic act study by the end of quarter one. Learn five new worship songs by August 31st. Canvas the entire town with a brochure by October 1st. Start three targeted Facebook posts per week by quarter three. Create a teaching website by December 31st. You see the difference between those and goals? There's no, there would be no debate in most people's minds as to whether or not you'd accomplish the objectives. And when you get there, what you've done is you've prevented fog from getting in. The power of objectives, because they're specific and measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-framed is, it holds you accountable. Did we get there or not? And then... There's a whole host of activities. Assignments can be made about who will do what. That is where we now then define the activities that people will engage in to accomplish our mission. There's an increasing level of detail. And I, uh, I, I, did, this, I did this workshop a year ago. Um, a, year ago this, a year ago in October up in um, Portage, Indiana. And they, they took what I said to heart. And the entire congregation came together, came up with a mission, goals and objectives. And I've talked to the, the two men who are now elders there. And they say it has transformed the congregation. That is at the heart of effective leadership. Now, in your materials, and we're bringing this session to a close, I am suggesting that families need to do the same thing. Uh, My wife and I, there's just the two of us, but we have a mission on our refrigerator at home. 
and we sit down and we talk about goals and objectives. There is a sample in your workbook on page 8. Notice in the sample, the mission, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's borrowing from Joshua's statement. But you've got this fortify and build up our marriage, train our children, encourage our church family. Then you've got objectives. Then you've got possible activities. Sometimes people ask me, what are some other possible goal missions for a family? Here are some. Engaging in good works to glorify God. Seeking to serve and share our Savior with others. Christ in us in all things. Loving as God loved us. Just like this is the one we have on our refrigerator. Just like Jesus in thought, in word, in action. It's our mission. My wife and I. Uh, imitating him every day in every way. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule about what it should say or what it should look like, but it should satisfy the three M's. That is a, a simple document that I am encouraging fathers and wives, mothers and fathers, with their children if they're old enough to do at the beginning of the year and post it and talk about it so that you don't fall victim to the activity trap. If we're to be shining lights in a community as families, I think it's important for us to be clear about what God wants us to be. Now, on the next page of your materials is a similar document for congregations. Um, and you can read at that at your leisure. Um, I, would, I would say this before we bring this session to a close, I would argue that if, if you come up with a mission and goals and objectives in a congregation, it's best to do it collaboratively with the members who are wanting to be a part of that. Why do you think it would be crucial to have everybody engaged in that? Everybody be on the same page. Huh? Everybody be on the same page. Everybody's on the same page. Ownership. Ownership. There was another congregation I did this for, and here's what their practice had been. Every year, at the beginning of the year, the elders would create a theme and goals for the congregation for the coming year, but they would do that in isolation from the members and simply announce it. When that happens, it isn't mine. But if I am engaged in helping to frame it, then I take ownership for it. And when I take ownership for it, I'm going to be more supportive of making it happen. So that is, again, an encouragement. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go into some additional sessions. Okay, so this is, and by the way, there's a, a blank form of that, I believe, in your materials. But this is why I say this is, is so crucial, is that we need to be clearer about who we are and we're not, oh wait, here's some samples. I, I forgot that I provided some samples here. We share Christ with the world. Uh, true disciples making new disciples. Uh, we serve the Lord, strengthen each other, seek the lost. We show Christ in us and share him with the world. We worship God, equip believers, share the word. Those are much, much easier to remember than that kind of lengthy mission that we'd seen earlier. Simple's better. Memorable, motivating. When people hear a mission, be it in the home or in a church, the reaction should be, that's us. That's what we do. Uh, and not questions about what it might be or could be. And so that's my encouragement as kind of the first session in making for better leaders in the home and church. Clarity about purpose, direction. It is at the heart of what makes a truly effective leader. And then you have on page 10 a blank for your use, but there's nothing especially notable about that. You can use whatever form you'd like to use. All right, I want to pause here. We're going to take a break for about five minutes to stretch before we get in, into part two. But I want to do ask whether or not there are any questions or insights from anybody. I've given you a lot in a very short period of time. But I, I truly, truly believe the most effective organizations, churches, homes, businesses, have people who clearly know why we exist. 
they will always outperform those who have no clue. All right, any questions? Make sense? All right, let's take a five minute break. When we get back, we're gonna get into some really interesting stuff where I'm gonna really share with you what I believe to be leadership, all right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, blow your minds, all right? So five minutes, it's eight o'clock right now, 8.05, let's, let's be ready to resume.